We are here tonight to study from the book of Acts, and so I would invite you to be turning with me to the last half of Acts chapter 18. We'll be there in just a few moments, but I hope all of you can come together this coming Sunday. We'll be there for worship at 9 o'clock and also at 11, and then for Bible class in between at 10. So one of the two worship services, if you could sign up on Sign Up Genius, that would be great. We would really appreciate that. But I hope to see you this coming Sunday at 9, 10, and 11. And again, for our members, Sign Up Genius helps. If you're a guest, feel free to uh, just be there. We would love to see you, even if you're not able to sign up. Uh, also, please remember that we plan to get together this coming Saturday at noon at Brigham County Park in the village of Blue Mounds, Wisconsin, right over there next to Blue Mound State Park. I think we'll be at shelter number one. And if you have any questions about that, get in touch with Gary or Sarah. I think we're treating that kind of potluck style, so bring something for you and your family. And we'll plan on having some room to spread out there and be able to do some fellowship in the great outdoors. And they've said that there's a good overview, a good look out there for the fall colors. If things are changing out there as they are around here, I'm really looking forward to being together with all of you. Uh, tonight we continue with our study of the book of Acts. So we're jumping back into it, the book of Gospel Action written by Luke. The beloved physician, he's writing to a man by the name of Theophilus, kind of giving him a history of the early church, focusing primarily on the ministry of Peter in the first third of the book, and then Paul for the remaining two-thirds. Up to this point in the book, we've looked at the first 18 chapters, so we're partway through chapter 18 tonight. In the ABCs of Acts, we had the Ascension, the beginning of the church in chapter 2, the man who couldn't walk, who was carried and cured in chapter 3. We had the determined disciples who wouldn't stop preaching in Acts 4 and Acts 5. We had the empty jail. In chapter 6, we had the first deacons, but always with a question mark, since they are not uh, specifically referred to as being deacons, although they do the work the deacons seem to do. In Acts 7, we had Stephen, the great hero. In Acts 8, we had the eunuch asking, how can I, how can I understand unless someone teaches me or guides me? In chapter 9, I am Jesus. In chapter 10, we had the journey to Joppa. In Acts 11, Peter was, um, or we had the reminder, kingdom now includes Gentiles. In chapter 12, Peter liberated again. In 13, we had missionaries sent out. In chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas had to convince the crowds that they were not gods but men. In chapter 15, we had the reminder that the old law is not binding. So a lot of Gentiles were being brought into the faith. A lot of the Jewish people were objecting to that. And so they got together and uh, kind of clarified things a little bit for the benefit of those new believers. In Acts 16, we had the Philippian jailer converted. Lydia is converted there as well. In Acts 17, we had questions answered in Athens with Paul preaching on the Areopagus in Athens, Greece. And then last week, we looked at the first half of Acts chapter 18. We come to the end of uh, Paul's second missionary journey in the first half of 18. And tonight, we plan on finishing Acts 18 and moving into the first 10 verses, I believe, of chapter 19. And the summary is reasoning with a preacher. So R for this chapter, reasoning with a preacher. In the second half of Acts 18, Acts 18, we come to Paul's third missionary journey. And I know it's a little bit weird, though, uh, because we actually have something that happens kind of meanwhile. So it's not really the beginning of his third journey right now, although it kind of is. But uh, kind of meanwhile, we have some more details, maybe as Paul is traveling, as he's getting started on his trip, as he makes his way over to Ephesus in chapter 19. Uh, Luke has to explain and he has to give some background material about what happens in Ephesus before Paul gets there. Because without this explanation, really the first few verses of chapter 19 don't make nearly enough sense. And so we're thankful for the last half of 18 to kind of get us there. So at this point, Paul is heading toward Ephesus. And Luke tells us what is happening in Ephesus as Paul is on his way there. And once again, I'll refer to a study sheet on the major events in the life of Paul, first compiled by Dal Flatt, one of my professors down at Freed Artemann University in Tennessee. As I said a week or two ago, this is one of the most helpful sheets of paper that I've ever seen when it comes to understanding Acts and the life of Paul and the dates and the circumstances behind most of Paul's letters. Uh, most of you should have this already. I've copied it a number of times through the years. We've kind of reduced it, put it in a format we can tape in the back of our Bible. If you don't have this, if you have no way of getting it, let me know. I'd be glad to drop one in the mail or email it or whatever it takes. 
Um, I think it's in the description of last week's video lesson on YouTube. It's also under articles on the Four Lakes Congregation website. I think up on the top there, we've got grow as one of the headings. So if you want to grow in your faith, click here. We've got sermons. We've got a number of things and we've got articles. So under articles, under the grow tab, uh, we should have a link to this um, study guide on the major uh, events in the life of Paul. So you can get to it in that way. And I'll try to put it uh, put it in the description of tonight's video if I can remember to do that. But uh, it is a chronology of Paul's life uh, outlining the dates of his travels and the places and the dates of all of the letters that he writes. Uh, the three Roman numerals indicate Paul's three missionary journeys. So we've been on one, two, and now we are getting ready for three. So I've grayed out everything but the third missionary journey here. Uh, hopefully making it a little bit clearer that the third journey takes place from 52 to 57 AD. It involves Paul, Titus, and Luke. Ephesus is one of his main stops. That's where he spends most of the time on this journey. We'll be there tonight. And on this journey, he writes the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, the book of Romans, and perhaps the book of Galatians. We're a little unclear about the, the dating of that book. It might have been written earlier. Uh, but if we take the late date on Galatians, it would be written during this time period. But uh, I share this as something of an outline concerning where we'll be from Acts 18.23, where we're starting tonight, through Acts 21, verse 17, where we'll be over the next couple weeks. So let's pick up tonight with Acts 18.23 through verse 28. Acts 18.23 through 28. And having spent some time there... He left and passed successively through the Galatian region and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he had arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. You'll notice up in verse 23, we have a reference to Paul spending some time there. Well, I know we're kind of jumping in on the middle of this chapter here, but if we were to look back at that previous paragraph, we find that the there in this verse refers to Antioch, the city of Antioch. Remember, the church in Antioch sent Paul out on his second missionary journey, and so we went back there last week to report on that journey. So he's reporting to one of his primary supporting congregations. So after spending some time there, it's now time to head out again on another journey. In your copy of the Bible, you may have a heading on this paragraph indicating that this is Paul's third missionary journey. If you don't have that, it may be good to write it in there if you have that ability, if you believe in writing in your Bible. Um, and it's good to write the ABCs of Acts in there. I know I haven't mentioned that lately, but I know we review these on a regular basis. And if you haven't written these in your main copy of the Bible you normally read from, that'd be a good time to do that. But just write those in as a summary of each chapter. Uh, we don't have many details on the beginning of this journey, how it starts, who decides on it, who says who's going where and with whom. But uh, we find in this little verse here that he passes pretty quickly through the Galatian region in Phrygia. Uh, for the purpose of strengthening all the disciples. I think I was reading uh, Brother Wayne Jackson's commentary earlier, and he said something about that word strengthening, I believe, uh, referring to propping up. And so the idea of propping up, or kind of helping them, giving them strength as they grow in their Christian faith. And I think that reminds us that when we teach and convert people, it's usually not good to just leave them there. But we need to follow up, and we need to go back, see if they have any questions, and uh, not just leave them alone for the rest of their lives, dunk them in water and be done with it, but that's just the beginning of the journey. And I know their growth is up to them, but it's also up to the church. And by the church, I don't mean just the preacher or the elders or the deacons, but really that's up to all of us to kind of check in and try to encourage them and, and prop them up in the sense that Paul did here. 
And so we need to be doing some follow-up, making sure they continue to learn and to grow. That's what Paul does in this passage. Uh, this is where we get to the, the meanwhile passage. So as Paul is making his way to Ephesus on this third missionary journey, uh, we're introduced here to a man by the name of Apollos. And we find Apollos was born in Alexandria. I, we're not, not given the detail. I'm assuming that the Alexandria referred to here is Alexandria, Egypt. I mean, when you said Alexandria in the ancient world, everybody knew you were talking about the Alexandria in Egypt. And so Apollos is an Egyptian by birth, which was interesting. They also had a large uh, Jewish population down there in Alexandria. Uh, you may remember from world history that Alexandria was home to one of the largest libraries in the ancient world. And uh, it burned for a while. They had some fires there. It really wasn't one ginormous um, poof and it's gone. But kind of over the years, it, it uh, disintegrated and kind of lost favor. But uh, it, was, it was a place of learning. It was a center of education and research, Alexandria was. Uh, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Bible that Jesus used, was translated by a number of scholars uh, down in Alexandria, Egypt. So that's kind of what they were known for down there. That maybe tells us something about Apollos and some of his background. He was familiar with all of this. In verse 24, we find Apollos is described then as being eloquent and as being mighty in the scriptures. So perhaps he is a good public speaker. As I remember it, Moses uh, one of his excuses for not leading God's people was that he was not eloquent. Remember that? I'm not a good speaker. And so God took care of that excuse by giving him Aaron as his spokesperson. He kind of took that off the table. Uh, but here Apollos is eloquent. So he's a good speaker. Uh, he knows the word of God. He is a good uh, communicator. So a good combination there to know the word of God and to be good at communicating it. And he's uh, willing to use these talents for the Lord. Notice in verse 25, though, we have our first clue that something isn't quite right. He's been instructed in the ways of the Lord. He's speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus. But he's acquainted only with the baptism of John. And so we have a problem here. Uh, by way of very brief review, we know John the Immerser was the forerunner of Jesus. And in preparing the way for Jesus, John preaches a baptism of repentance. It's for the forgiveness of sins. We read that in Mark 1 verse 4. It was an immersion in water. And there's that verse, I think in John perhaps, where um, they were baptizing in a certain place in the Jordan River because there was much water there. So this wasn't a baptism you could do with just a little water. It was a lot of water involved. So it was for the forgiveness of sins following repentance and in a sense, it looked forward to the coming of Jesus. It was anticipating the arrival of the Lord. Well, the baptism of Jesus was very similar in that it was an immersion. But instead of looking forward to the coming of Jesus, the baptism of Jesus uh, looked back to his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, also, Jesus' baptism results in us being given the gift of the Holy Spirit. We read about that in Acts 2 verse 38. And so there are some similarities, but there are also some key differences between the baptism of John and the baptism of Jesus. They are identical in form, we might say, uh, in that both require an immersion in water. So they look very similar. Outwardly, they are identical, but they are different in the purpose behind them, in the understanding that people had to have when being baptized. So there is a key difference. Apollos then seems to be preaching John's baptism at a time when it was no longer in effect, when he should have been preaching Jesus' baptism. So he's a good communicator. He knows the word of God. He knows the old law. He's good at comparing that. But the message is a bit off, isn't it? So he's a bit behind. He, there, there's something he's missing there. And so that sets us up for what happens next. And notice in the second half of verse 26, we are reintroduced to Priscilla and Aquila, a Christian couple. These two are mentioned six times in four New Testament books. So they're spread out uh, with Priscilla, the wife, being mentioned first in four out of those six references. And that's at least a little bit unusual. I think we talked about this a week or two ago when we met these two in Acts. 
So, and we're not given a reason. Maybe Paul was closer to a, uh, Priscilla than he was Aquila. That's uh, that's a possibility. Um, we're more friendly with some people than we are with others. Maybe Paul met her first. Um, we had a, a mom and a daughter move to Janesville many, many years ago. And when they first moved, the daughter filled out the visitor card and put her name first. And so you've got this, I don't know, eight-year-old kid and uh, she puts her name first. So Lisa and Jane. Well, I looked at that visitor card. I kind of memorized it for the next meeting of the church together. And uh, in my mind, Lisa must have been the mom and Jane was the daughter. Uh, but lo and behold, the daughter filled the card out. Okay. And so every time I meet those two people, even today, I have to think through in my mind. I have to look at that visitor card and I have to flip it there because Jane is the mom. Lisa is the daughter. Lisa, of course, now is married, has a family of her own. But I'm just saying maybe that's a possibility. Maybe Paul met Priscilla first or maybe Luke met Priscilla first since he's the author here. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, Priscilla's name comes before Aquila's name, the husband, in four out of the six references. Another chance uh, possibility is that uh, she was the more spiritually mature spouse in that family. And I think we've seen that through the years. We've known Christian women who are uh, more knowledgeable of the, the scriptures than their husbands are. No problem there. That's the way it happens sometimes. Or maybe there's some other reason that we don't know. I'm just pointing this out as, as some possibilities here. Uh, I preached on Priscilla and Aquila a number of years ago, and the graphic from that sermon has been one of the most requested PowerPoints through the years. We don't put the PowerPoints out there due to copyright issues, just with the images and that kind of thing. At least for many years we didn't before we went with the live stream. But I had created a graphic, and it was illustrating how Priscilla and Aquila moved around throughout the New Testament. And so they would pop up here, they'd pop up there. And in my mind, as I went to preach on that, I'm like, I got to figure this out. And I don't really know of anybody else who's really uh, made a graphic like that to figure it out. And so I put a little note on the text of that sermon asking people or saying, if you want this, I'd be glad to email it to you personally. We just don't put it on our uh, website. And it's interesting to me, every few months I'll get an email from somebody uh, somewhere in the world saying, hey, I noticed that you're offering this thing about Priscilla and Aquila. Can you send that to me? And I just find that interesting. We don't get that for many lessons, uh, the follow-up in that way. So I'll try to see if I can get it to work in this format. No guarantees here. Uh, but in chronological order, they move from Rome to Corinth in Acts 18, 1 through 4. And that's what we looked at a couple weeks ago when the emperor kicked out the Jews um, that's when they ended up moving over to Corinth. They then moved from Corinth to Ephesus. And we say that because last week they were in Corinth. Now they're in Ephesus. So they've moved from Rome to Corinth to Ephesus. And there's a reference to this also over in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 19. Then they move from Ephesus back to Rome. And so they pop up again in Rome in Romans 16 verses 3 through 5. And then finally, they apparently move from Rome back to Ephesus. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 19. So that's kind of the, uh, at least the cycle of their, their lives, as far as I can tell. So there is some, uh, uh, some consistency through scripture that they move. They are really not in one place for very long. And I know the graphic is rather primitive these days, but I really haven't found anything else like it. And that probably explains why so many people email and ask for it. So Priscilla and Aquila move throughout the Roman Empire for various reasons, but they are always helpful in some way. And that's interesting to me. I know we have a number of people through the years move into Madison and they're here for a short time to work somewhere. Or maybe they have a grant. Uh, we had the Ajari family, for example, from Ghana. Went to school in Kentucky, came up here, was here for a couple of years. The grant wore out after, uh, ran out after a couple years and they ended up moving to Saskatchewan and now they moved to Maine and and so we have people travel around and we're thankful for those that when they move here, they plug in immediately and they put themselves to work. And that's exactly what Priscilla and Aquila seem to do. So back in verse 26, as Priscilla and Aquila are now in Ephesus, they hear Apollos preaching. They have the knowledge to determine that what he's preaching is wrong. And then they have the courage to speak up and say something about it. And that right there is rather rare. Uh, there's so much we could say about this, but I would start with the reminder that they know enough about what is right 
to recognize wrong when they hear it. And that's huge, isn't it? That's great. If we know the Word of God well enough to know error when we hear it, that is a great first step. And so we want to be at that point when somebody says something wrong, uh, we don't just agree with it and say, oh, wow, yeah, I never thought about that before and move on. But rather, we know enough to slow down and say, wait a minute, um, that doesn't seem quite right. At least in our own minds, we can figure out this is a wrong thing that I just heard. I would also emphasize that they don't just ignore what they hear when they know it's wrong, do they? But they love the truth and they love Apollos enough to speak up. A time or two, I've heard John, one of our elders, make the comment at the beginning of a sermon or a Bible class that if you hear him say something wrong, you would be his best friend if you would pull him aside and point that out to him. And I know we hear quite a bit at these days about fact-checking, and uh, but this seems to be an early example of it, doesn't it? And so they love him enough to speak up and to say something, not just ignoring it and allowing him to go on and preach the same thing thousands of other times throughout the Roman Empire, uh, but they know that it's wrong and they have the courage to actually say something. Uh, I would also emphasize how Priscilla and Aquila correct Apollos. And as a preacher, I need to point this out. I'm thankful that they don't uh, stand up and start shouting in the assembly, right? That's not the way they handle this. We don't have pitchforks and, and all that kind of thing uh, pulled out. They don't take it to the elders first. They don't talk to the people sitting next to them. Oh my goodness, did you hear what that guy just said? They don't do that kind of thing. But notice Luke says that they take him aside. And so they do this privately. And from my point of view, this seems to be the golden rule, doesn't it? We are to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Not as they have done unto us. Not as people have done unto us. Uh, but we are to treat people as we would like to be treated. So certainly that uh, plays in here. They pull him aside privately. Uh, some of you might remember we had a man here years ago who tried to teach that women could never have a biblical discussion with a man. And so a woman could never do anything to impart spiritual knowledge to a man, is really, that's as far as he took it. Uh, even standing around after worship in a group of two or three people discussing the scriptures. And uh, it's just a, a, a wild picture. And and I remember we were, we were standing in the aisle after Wednesday class one time talking about this. And I said, so even if a woman came up here and, and talked with the three of us, um, she would not be permitted under your understanding of this to even utter a word. And he said, that's, that's right. Uh, she would not be able to impart spiritual knowledge in any way to us. Well, when he said that, I mentioned this passage about Priscilla and Aquila. And I said, well, what about Priscilla here? And he said that Priscilla's role in this passage was to fluff the pillows. Those are the words that he used. She was there to fluff the pillows. She was only there in a supporting role, and she had absolutely no part of the actual conversation concerning the Word of God. All right, that was kind of shocking to me. And so I pointed out, though, how Luke says that they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. In other words, both Priscilla and Aquila played some role in communicating scriptural truth to Apollos, the eloquent and knowledgeable gospel preacher, and he really had no answer for that. Now, this doesn't mean Priscilla was preaching, does it, or that she was leading a Bible class in some way. That's not what's happening here. But it's clear from the actual words in this passage that Priscilla played some role here besides fluffing the pillows. And I hope we can see that. It, it goes beyond that. And personally, I'm very thankful for the Priscillas in my life who have taken the time to bring me up to speed on some things by pulling me aside in this way. And often it starts with something like this. Baxter, I, I thought I heard you say this. And you can kind of see where that's going, right? We're looking for clarity. And often it's able, yes, I can see that didn't sound right or that didn't come out right and we correct it right there. Or maybe it is a misunderstanding and we end up fixing it in some way. But I'm thankful uh, for the godly Christian women in my life through the years who have taken the time and have had the courage uh, to pull me aside and straighten me out in a good way. I'm very thankful for that. And, and those are the Priscillas in my life. By the way, 
Um, you know what Priscilla and Aquila were doing here? They were reasoning with a preacher, weren't they? They were reasoning with a preacher. And this is why our summary of Acts 18 in the ABCs of Acts is reasoning with a preacher. And so when we come to this chapter, I hope we understand that. In the last few verses, I would also point out that we have no record of Apollos getting mad here. Uh, he doesn't get offended. He doesn't defend himself. Uh, he doesn't quit preaching altogether. I've known people who may react in that way. Forget it. I'm out of here. I, I can't take this. You know, you, you can't be questioning me, that kind of thing. No reaction like that. But he apparently takes it quite well. In fact, he wants to keep preaching in Achaia, in Greece. And in response, the Christians in Ephesus encourage him to do that. And not only do they encourage him, but they write a letter to the disciples over in Achaia, encouraging them to welcome him. And we don't have the contents of that letter, but I would assume something like, hey, this guy named Apollos is a faithful member of the church over here in Ephesus. He's done a great job communicating the gospel, and, and we hope he can do the same over there. And so we're introducing you to him uh, in that way. Uh, this, by the way, is something we try to continue to do even today. Uh, when a Christian moves from one congregation to another, we try to establish some kind of uh, communication between the two churches. We open the door between us uh, kind of as a way to encourage the person to be accepted and to be put to work right away at the new congregation. A letter is obviously acceptable. That's what we find here. Uh, we've also done this through email. Um, or through a Facebook message, or through a phone call. Uh, but there, I think there's a huge value in connecting in this way, and it was done a number of times in the New Testament. Uh, once Apollos arrives over in Achaia, he jumps right in, helping the believers, powerfully refuting the Jews in public, uh, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. And so Apollos goes straight to work, using his talents. And now he is teaching and preaching the truth, instead of error. And that's all thanks to Priscilla and Aquila and the courage and the wisdom they had in pulling this man aside. Well, this brings us to the end of Acts 18. But the consequences of Apollos and his misunderstanding are still lingering for a bit in the city of Ephesus. So there's kind of this cloud of error that's out there that has affected some people. And this brings us back to Paul as he now arrives in Ephesus over in Acts chapter 19. So let's move over to Acts 19, 1 through 7. Acts 19, verses 1 through 7. It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, No, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you, you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who is coming after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. There were in all about 12 men. So Apollos is over in Achaia in Corinth. Paul is just getting started on his third missionary journey. He shows up in Ephesus. He meets with the disciples, the students, the followers of Jesus. And with a certain group, he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So in my mind, as a preacher... Paul has heard something to make him question this. It's not just a random thing. I don't know, some personal conversation. but And so he starts probing a little bit. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answer, no, we haven't even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Well, that's somewhat concerning, isn't it? And, you know, first of all, I would say and point out here, it's okay to ask people some questions about their faith. Sometimes people get offended. Uh, if you don't just take their word for something, of course I'm a Christian. How dare you even ask kind of thing. But, uh, you know, if you ask anything to clarify, people have a way of getting uptight in a hurry. But here, these men answer. So their, their goal here is to be pleasing to God. They want to be right with God more than anything. So they, they cooperate with Paul as he looks for clarity here. And there is a problem, isn't there? And so Paul then digs in. He digs even deeper. He wants to know more about their baptism. And when Paul finds that they were baptized with John's baptism, 
he explains that John's baptism pointed to the future. And so they were baptized properly as to the form of baptism. In other words, it was an immersion in water. He's not arguing sprinkling versus pouring versus immersion. But something was off concerning the purpose of it. The reason behind it was missing. They, they were baptized by a baptism that was no longer in effect. Therefore, in verse 5, when they hear the truth on this, Luke tells us that they are baptized now in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then, in a separate act, in verse 6, Paul lays his hands on them, and they receive the miraculous gift of the Spirit, allowing them to prophesy, to speak God's word on God's behalf, and to speak in tongues, that is, in other languages. At the end of this paragraph, we learn that there were 12 men who are in this situation. So out of all the people in Ephesus, there are at least 12 men um, that have been contacted maybe by Apollo. So we'll get back to that in just a little bit. Um, sometimes we might refer to these 12 men as being rebaptized, And in a sense, they were. We understand that. We can use accommodative language in that sense. In a sense, yes, they were rebaptized. But in another sense, they were never really baptized properly the first time, were they? And so they're actually being baptized properly the first time right here. But as far as I can tell, this is the only example of anyone being baptized again in the New Testament. And again, it's not really again, again. This is baptism the first time, but it's the second time after a baptism they thought was proper. I hope that makes sense. And we may face something similar today. We, we come upon this from time to time. And so we're thankful then for this example. Uh, instead of ignoring it, uh, we have Paul's example of asking some questions and probing a little bit, uh, trying to clarify exactly what somebody has done. Uh, unfortunately, we have many teachers like Apollos out there, don't we? Uh, sometimes meaning well, sometimes not meaning well, uh, but nevertheless teaching what is wrong. And so sometimes people have had help misunderstanding the gospel message. And remember, these men are in Ephesus. They had been baptized improperly with John's baptism a number of years after it was a valid baptism. And this, ex this is the exact same thing Apollos was wrong about. So it's kind of hard not to put these two together. Uh, this is one of those situations where the chapter division is pretty unfortunate. The last paragraph of chapter 18 is very strongly tied to the first paragraph here in chapter 19. So I'm glad we were able to split our class tonight in a way that we could combine these two accounts. Apollos seems to have caused a problem that the Apostle Paul is now fixing. And this is important for us to understand today because many times people are baptized today for the wrong reasons. They may be baptized into a denominational church. Or they may be baptized for some reason other than for the forgiveness of sins. Maybe thinking they were saved before they were baptized. Or they might have been baptized, in quotes, um, by being sprinkled as babies. Uh, but that is not a proper understanding of what baptism really is. And so they need to be baptized again. And again, we use that word again accommodatively. Uh, we're saying be baptized now for the first time for the proper reason, with the proper understanding of what you're doing, making sure that you're doing it in the right way. So they must obey the gospel, even though they might think that they've already done that. And I think this passage is a good example of that. There's no dishonor, absolutely at all, in going back and restudying the issue and in being baptized properly. And we certainly shouldn't be too squeamish in asking some very pointed questions. It could be a little bit uncomfortable at times, uh, but eternity is at stake. We need to get this right. This is extremely important. And as somebody has pointed out, it is impossible to be taught wrong and baptized right. Doesn't that apply here? It is impossible to be taught wrong and baptized right. These people were apparently taught wrong. They were taught improperly by Apollos. And now they are being taught correctly by Paul, and he is correcting this misunderstanding. So thankfully, these men seem to take it well, and they do what they need to do. Well, let's close tonight by looking at Acts 19, verses 8 through 10. Acts 19, verses 8 through 10. And he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. 
But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people, he withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. This took place for two years, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. After studying with and baptizing the twelve men, uh, Paul goes to the synagogue, as his tradition has been on his previous journeys. Uh, He does this for three months, and it goes well. He is reasoning, he is persuading people concerning the kingdom of God, but as usual, some eventually object to that. Uh, Some become hardened, they become disobedient, Uh, some speak evil of the way, that's again one other way the church was referred to, the kingdom of God, and instead of battling it out in the synagogue every day, instead of wasting time fighting this battle that he can't win, Paul leaves. And he simply takes the Lord's advice to leave, and he goes, kind of shaking the dust off of his feet, in a sense. He goes to the school of Tyrannus. We don't know much about this at all. We assume it must have been a private school of some kind. Paul either rented it for a few hours a day. Maybe they simply allowed him to use some space. I think in the early days of the Lord's Church here in Madison, uh, back in the 40s or 50s, perhaps, we met in a Jewish synagogue, the Gates of Heaven synagogue that's now at uh, James Madison Park. Well, uh, the Jewish people weren't using it on Sunday, and so uh, we rented or borrowed it from them, and that gave us a place to meet many, many decades ago. Maybe that's kind of what Paul is doing here, that the space doesn't matter. Uh, but they did have a space that was warm and dry or whatever, a place to get together to study. And so he uses that as a place to continue teaching for the next two years. Uh, At the end here, notice that during that time, all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. In other words, uh, Paul is very, very successful in preaching during this time. Uh, This is a good place for us to stop and take a break tonight. Paul is in Ephesus on his third journey. Things are going well. And we'll pick up next week, if the Lord wills, with what happens next on Paul's third missionary journey. Uh, Thank you for taking the time to study together with us tonight. Uh, I hope you can be present for worship at one of the two services this Sunday at 9 or 11, and then also for class in between at 10. That gives the two groups a chance to meet. So come early and stay late and take advantage of that good Christian fellowship. I love going outside. I want to get out of the building. You know, the whole virus thing. I'm just going to go outside. And uh, if you want to join me outside between class and worship and all that and fellowship, I, I, you know, I book it and I get out there. And I love talking with you outdoors like that for as long as we possibly can. But I hope you can join us this coming Sunday. Be sure to use Sign Up Genius if you can. And uh, let me know if there's something you need to be praying about. I want to try to do the bulletin a little bit early this week, maybe on Friday if I can. So if you have any updates, uh, let me know. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the God of truth, and we praise you tonight for giving us your perfect and inspired word. We're thankful that we can read it for ourselves. We're thankful for the clarity that it brings to our lives. As we teach and preach, as we share your word with those around us, we're also thankful for fellow Christians who may have a better understanding of your word than we do. Sometimes we miss some things. Sometimes we hear something, we repeat it, and we get it wrong. And we're thankful when others speak up to teach us your word more accurately. We pray that we would always be open to legitimate correction. And as we correct others ourselves, we pray for a spirit of grace as we speak the truth in love. Thank you, Father, for saving us. And thank you for making us a part of your plan to take the gospel to the whole world. In Jesus we pray. Amen.